bad news that the cost of going to UC is going up. I thought I'd just tell you what I would do if I were in charge, and when I present what I would do, you'll see why I'm not in charge. <laughs> if I were in charge, it would be free. <laughs> but if you weren't serious, you'd be gone. No repeats, you flunk one course. Sayonara. Because if it's free, there are going to be a lot of people who are willing to take your shoes. So you don't goof around, you don't march around, you don't do anything except work. And you try to improve yourself as much as you possibly can. And then, after you graduate, if you go to graduate or professional school, we defer things. But after you graduate, we take 5% of what you earn for the next 10 years. If I don't teach you anything worthwhile, and you're a barista at Starbucks, I don't get paid off. But if I teach you something incredibly <coughs> valuable, and you get a high paying job, then I get rewarded for doing that. On the other hand, if you take four years of college and then you get sick or hit by a car, and you're on disability, you aren't on the hook for 50,000 bucks, but now you can't possibly pay back. So you don't have the stress, you have an opportunity, everyone can go, but if you don't work, you're out of there. That's how I would do it. We'd have to settle on the percentage. We'd have to make the numbers work. But it could be done. OK. Uh, I keep hearing on the news all these people dying. And what's getting alarming is that they aren't that much older than I am. <laughs> So it's starting to become sort of a constant drumbeat of Donna Summer died and so-and-so died. The question is, did they do something wrong or were they unlucky or some combination of both? The answer is you usually make your own luck. Do you remember the ancient saying, man sana in corpore sano, a sound mind in a sound body. That's the Aristotelian ideal, and that's what you should strive for. And you shouldn't assume that that's going to be easy. No one said easy. Adversity is your friend. It's what makes you tougher and makes you have the ability to withstand all the knocks that you're going to get in life. You don't want things too easy. Maybe that's why the rich movie stars and rock stars don't live long. Things are too easy and they're unmotivated to do anything. And without the motivation, you don't do anything and then you die. People who retire early die quicker. They think, yeah, great, I can now retire early. Statistically, they die much quicker than people who keep working. Now that's kind of the same thing. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, I, I just had to inject a little bit about something that concerns me. <clears throat> I keep seeing on these clips clean natural gas. 
And I'm sure you all think it's, you probably have a positive opinion of it, I don't know. You may have forgotten the San Bruno blow up that leveled all those houses, but that doesn't happen that often. And there is a lot of natural gas that can be obtained by unconventional methods, and I'd just like to have a look. The method that they're using all over the United States now is called hydraulic fracturing. I'll tell you a little bit about it. And you access so-called shale gas. And boy, is it being carried out at huge scale. Many people in the United States do not own the mineral rights <coughs> to their property. You own the land on top. But if I discover gold under your house, I can drill in from the side and mine it because you do not own the mineral rights. I didn't sell you that. Okay, and that's very important because most people don't read the fine print on what they do or don't own. I don't know why that's white. <laughs> that's a new one. Well, let's hope it doesn't continue. Air pollution, groundwater pollution, and possibly earthquakes are concerned. They've had swarms of earthquakes in Oklahoma where they didn't have any before. And the methane from, that we get is very useful in industrial processes for heat. They're now using this gas to refine oil. They can refine the oil so cheaply into gasoline that they can afford then to ship it in ships, the gasoline to Mexico and put the Mexican refineries out of business. So we're shipping gasoline down there because the price is higher. That raises our price, by the way. And then also to generate electricity, unless San Onofre comes online, the AES natural gas peaker plant out in Huntington Beach is going to be fired up again and then we'll start having the brown haze and various things that we have avoided while that's been off. But if everyone switches on the air in the summer, the grid will go down unless you have enough power. Air conditioning takes a, a trillion watts. The price has fallen, and we have jobs. Jobs for the boys. And the jobs don't require a great deal of education. So they could be ideal for certain sectors. But you have to be careful if you're doing a job that you're doing something constructive and not destructive. And sometimes it's hard to tell. The gas companies pay off farmers. Farming's kind of in a slump some years. Some guy comes along and says, look, we'll pay a hundred K cash. All you have to do is let us set up this little, little rig here. We'll drill way down, we'll get the gas, we'll take off, everything will be as it was, <coughs> except you'll be richer. And of course, if you don't own the mineral rights, they just come along and set up a rig. There's a guy in Colorado who has this huge, noisy gas drilling rig 150 feet from his house. It's producing incredible air pollution, I'll get to that in a minute. His eyes itch, feels like somebody went down his sternum with a toilet brush, worries about the health of his kids. The reason why it's 150 feet away is because the law was written about 100 years ago, and they figured that if an oil derrick fell over 150 feet away, it wouldn't hit your house. The law is still on the books, and so... There you go. 
The scale is enormous. I'll give you a little map in a minute. But it's millions and millions of gallons of water, thousands of feet of drilling, and all over the place. It's a big boom. So then, if, if is natural gas our energy panacea, even if there's a lot of it? If I'm a diabetic, it doesn't matter if I have a thousand chocolate cakes. Maybe not. So here, here's an article. One thing you should do is you should go to the library and you should learn how to use a proper search engine like PubMed or ISI Web of Science or these various search engines. And you should, you should find topics that interest you and then find articles <coughs> written in refereed journals. You, not a blog, a refereed journal. Somebody else who's an expert read the manuscript and said, yeah, there may be some problems with it, but, or you may want to do this experiment and then we'll let you publish it, etc. And read those. And if you can't understand them, then you know you need to learn a lot more. When you first start out, you won't be able to understand a thing about the article. It'll have notation, jargon, abbreviations, etc. But gradually, as you read more of them, you'll start to come up to speed, and you'll be able to educate yourself then. And that's really a huge benefit of the access, the electronic access that we have. And of course, books are not half bad either, and there are plenty of them in the science library. Now here's an article that came out in 2011, Methane and the Greenhouse Gas Footprint of Natural Gas from Shale Formations. So if you're interested in what's going on, then this is an interesting article. And, and uh, they say, okay, we evaluate the greenhouse gas footprint of natural gas obtained by high volume hydraulic fracturing from shale formations, focusing on methane emissions. I've blown this up a little so it's easier to read. Methane itself, not CO2, but methane itself is a powerful greenhouse gas with a global warming potential that is far greater than that of carbon dioxide, particularly over the time horizon of the first few decades following emission. Methane contributes substantially to the greenhouse gas footprint of shale gas on shorter time scales, dominating it on a 20-year time horizon. The footprint for shale gas is greater than that for conventional gas or oil when viewed on any time horizon but particularly over 20 years. And here's the bad part. Compared to coal, that's the worst of the worst. The footprint of shale gas is at least 20% greater, and perhaps more than twice as great on the 20-year time horizon, and is comparable when compared over 100 years. The problem is, as I've mentioned several times why chemists don't like to work with gases, is gases always leak. No matter what you do, you have leaks. And if you're bringing up millions and millions of cubic feet of natural gas, all of which you're going to burn, by the way, into CO2 anyhow, which isn't a good idea, but let's leave that out, and a few percent leak, and it's 20 times more potent than the CO2 you produce from it, then you've doubled your greenhouse gas footprint. In other words, you're going to autoclave the whole planet by doing that. And here's a graph from this paper, the 20-year time horizon. They have a low estimate grams of carbon per megajoule of energy. A high estimate depends how much leaks and a lot of stuff. And this is the methane. The purple is the huge part. This is the CO2 after you burn it. And 
this is indirect CO2. Indirect CO2 is last time I checked when you set up a drilling rig, you have to power it somehow. Well, if you power it with diesel, you're creating a ton of CO2. And it takes a lot of muscle to drill down 8,000 feet and then pump in billions of gallons of, of water to do the hydraulic fracturing. Let's have a look. This is what they do. They start up here, then they come down, and then they've got tricky technology now. This is why it's unconventional. So they can turn the corner and they can drill in to this big layer of dark looking Marcellus shale that has a lot of gas trapped in it in tiny pores. Then they set off some high explosives. Usually they don't mention that, but you, that's pretty much part of mining last time I checked. There's a lot of explosions that go on. And then they pump down a ton of water and other stuff. And the other stuff pollutes the water. And the water gets polluted here as well because the reason this is shale is that this is an ancient marine formation and so it's got a ton of salt in it and other things. And when the water comes back up, it's polluted. You can't drink it, you can't use it for farming, you can't do anything with it, you have to treat it. And that treatment is going to cost energy. And it could be a lot. In fact, you could come out in the hole if you aren't careful. This is what a real rig looks like. They're big, they're loud, and they wreck the air for a long ways around. Because when you have methane leak out, you get a lot of ozone formation, and that's what makes your eyes itch and your throat burn and so forth. That's the air pollution on a very bad day when it looks grayish and you can't see anything. That's ozone in the troposphere. That's known to be bad. There are organisms, I think, that can live on hydrogen cyanide, but nothing can live on ozone. Ozone kills everything. So they drill 8,000 feet down. Lots of pipes going down there. Then 11,000 feet sideways and then millions of gallons of what they call frac fluid, which has things like hydrochloric acid and all sorts of things in it. And here are the trucks delivering all the stuff and all the truck drivers have jobs. And here's, they've cleared this area. This used to be green like this and, and now it looks like that. There's an environmental consequence for doing that because you have to build all these roads into everywhere, wreck the forest as you go. And then this is, a <laughs> each little dot here, like smallpox, is a well in West Virginia. So these are all hitting this gigantic ancient shale deposit that's underground that has a lot of gas in it. This is just West Virginia, then there's Pennsylvania, and now they're arguing about New York, there's Colorado, there's Montana, all these other places, because now they know how to prospect for these shale formations, and when they find one, if they have the rights to the mineral rights, they buy them and then they drill. And if the government owns the mineral rights and the government's broke, the government may sell it because it's worth some money. That's how things tend to go. Okay, let's do some review problems. Practice problem 47. Very topical. Let's purify some back frack. Back frack is the water that comes bubbling back out after you've pumped it down there with all those chemicals.
plus it's dissolved whatever happens to be down there, which you may not know exactly until it comes back up what it is. I think at first they were throwing it in the ocean, uh, in the rivers, and then people objected to that because that was having a very big environmental <coughs> impact. Then, and then the, the mining company said, fine, what we'll do is we'll divert the frac water to the municipal water treatment plants. And that drove the municipal water treatment guys crazy because the last step when you're treating wastewater usually is you chlorinate the water to make sure it doesn't have any bacteria, especially if it's from sewage and things like that. And normally that's okay, no big deal. But this has some bromide sometimes from the shale itself. And if you treat bromide with chlorine, you get bromine. And then that reacts with various things that are in the water. And you can get methyl bromide. Methyl bromide is just what they've outlawed as a fumigant for strawberries because it has a high vapor pressure and it is carcinogenic as all get out. It's a DNA methylating agent. It's known bad news. You don't want that in the water that you're going to be drinking and growing stuff with. So that's out. And so now the proposal, at least I read it on one brochure, the proposal is, well, we'll purify it by RO. We'll use reverse osmosis. Well, let's figure out then how much energy that takes, because we know a little bit about osmotic pressure and reverse osmosis. Let's just take a case study here and figure out what it would take. Okay. So I'm assuming that it's got 3.5% sodium chloride. This is on average, and 0.2% sodium bromide. It's got a lot of other stuff, arsenic, barium, things that chemists don't like to deal with. But they can be taken out. You just have, you know, if you want to work, you can clean things up. It's just like cleaning up your room. You have to want to do it, and it takes work. And there are levels of clean. If you want it to be like an operating theater, it's a lot more work than if you just want it to look good because somebody's dropping by for a cup of tea. Well, we've got our osmotic pressure equation, pi for fancy p equals i, that just keeps track of how many moles of particles times the concentration times r times t. And we'll assume two moles of ions each from sodium chloride and sodium bromide. It's not quite two because remember these charged particles tend to try to stick together a little bit and so they aren't totally independent and the osmotic pressure assumes they're totally independent. And let's assume 300 Kelvin, depending where they're doing it. If they're doing it in the summer, that's going to be quite accurate. Okay, <clears throat> three and a half weight percent. There are 35 grams of sodium chloride and two grams of sodium bromide per kilogram of solution which is nearly a liter of solution. So we'll assume it is. The concentrations thus are approximately, because we need the molar mass, we've got 35 grams per liter times one mole, 58.44 grams for sodium chloride, that's 0.6 molar, I think we did that with seawater earlier. And then we've got sodium bromide, two grams, and then that's 0.019 molar. The total number of particles or ions is then two times the sum of these because they're both uh, producing two moles of ions when one mole of salt dissolves. And therefore it's 1.24 molar. And then I just put this in, put in R, make sure all the units go away, and I find the osmotic pressure is 30 and a half atmospheres. That means I've got to push on the water with at least that much pressure to get it to go back so I can 
overcome the tendency of the fresh water to rush into the salt water and push it back the other way and get fresh water out. Of course, I have to have a suitable semi-permeable membrane, and that has to not tear, or then all my polluted water comes through, and it has to not clog, or else I can't jam anything through. And then I need a huge pump like pumping up a bike tire. As you start pumping and the tire gets full, it gets harder and harder to pump and you notice your arms get tired. And there's an energy cost to doing that. Let's have a look then at what that might be. So the 30.5 is the minimum pressure we must apply. And let's just use that minimum pressure and let's just force a hundred million gallons of water through at that pressure, the minimum. We need the volume of a hundred million gallons in liters, 378.5 million liters, and then let's just estimate, just using P times V, so, so much pressure, so much volume going through, PV is an energy unit, and we can convert it to joules by taking the ratio of the listed values of the gas constant. That's kind of a handy way to convert from liter atmospheres to joules. Just use the ratio of the gas constants. 30.5 atmospheres, I have 378 million liters, the ratio of 8.314 to 0.082, I get 1. 2 times 10 to the 12 joules. That's 1.2 trillion. If we had a 10 megawatt reverse osmosis system, it would have to run for 120,000 seconds or about 1.25 days. This is just very, very, very crude analysis. We can do better because we can actually look up what some of the pros on reverse osmosis have said. And the best estimate that I got reading the most recent literature is that it takes 5.6 kilowatt hours to purify a cubic meter for seawater. So if we use that, a hundred million gallons is about 378,000 cubic meters. And so we'll need to purify just the hundred million gallons, and there's a lot more water involved than that, believe me. We need two million kilowatt hours of electricity, which has to come from somewhere, presumably by burning the gas we've just fracked. Right? So we're going round and round in a circle. And a lot of stuff's getting used up. Yes? Can we go back to see the equation again? Sure. This one? Yeah. Question? Yes? Why do you assume that there's two moles each? Um, because when sodium chloride dissolves, I get Na plus and Cl minus. So, uh, remember, colligative properties depend on the number of particles, but not their type. Just the total number of particles in there. That's what dictates it. Therefore, if I have a mixture of things, I just have to figure out the total molarity of all the particles, and that's, that's what I need to know. To figure out the freezing point depression, the boiling point elevation, the osmotic pressure. I don't care what they are. <coughs> I just care how much. Yes? Well, I assume 300 Kelvin because I had to assume a temperature for the purpose of this calculation. Now, if I assume a high temperature, it's going to be a lot more work, and then on a hot day, it may be more than 300 Kelvin. So it, the amount of work I'm going to have to put is going to depend on how hot it is. If it's a hot day in Tennessee or something, it might 
be a good day to not run it, for example. Or I might want to run it in the winter. So anyway, 5.6 kilowatt hours, 2 million kilowatt hours, and even at 7 cents a kilowatt hour, if you're a big user, you might get that rate. I don't know. That's going to add up. Yeah. On the previous slide, where did you get 120,000 seconds from? I figured I had a 10 megawatt machine, and that's 10 million joules per second. And I know how many joules of energy I need to push it all through. And so I divide the, the two, and I get the number of seconds. And it came out to be about 120,000 in round numbers. Yes? No, it's two, and I add up the total molarity of sodium bromide and sodium chloride first. And then each of them produces two moles of ions, sodium chloride, sodium bromide, two each. Okay, so I added up the total concentration and then multiplied by two. If I have a salt like calcium chloride that produces three moles of ions, then what I have to do is set that aside, figure out how many moles of calcium chloride are there, and then multiply that by three, and then add it in to the total. The total dissolved solids, as they call it, in these waters is, is very high. Some of them come out like the Great Salt Lake. In other words, the chloride is the maximum amount of chloride you can dissolve in water. Because these are dried out ocean deposits, they could have tons of salt in there. And in actual fact, the water, <coughs> this polluted water, is so full of other stuff, sediment, particles of mud, stuff that's a nightmare for a reverse osmosis system because particles of mud and clay are just what you don't want with your nice semi-permeable membrane because they just clog the membrane and that's it. You're out of luck. The membrane's clogged, no water goes through, and now you're sitting there. Oh, well, let's change the membrane. So you have to first have a settling tank, you have to let the sediment settle, you have to make sure, and then you have to make sure that your membrane's not letting through any other nasty guys. Maybe it keeps out sodium and chloride and bromide, but lets through something else, because it wasn't designed with that in mind. So you have to check it. And then you have to replace the membranes, and you have to put a bunch of guys on it, and they have to watch it, they have to test the water, that comes out to make sure it's okay, and all that costs money. And it could be a lot of money. So the tendency will be to not do any of it. Because if it costs money and I don't have to do it, there's no law that says I have to do it, I don't. Okay, practice problem 48. In this problem, we'll make sure we can keep fracking in Montana in the winter. This was actually another proposed solution. I know what we'll do with all the salty water. We'll put it in some big, you know, basin and we'll let it dry and then we'll scoop up all the salt and we'll salt all the roads in the eastern U.S. in the, in the wintertime with it and de-ice the roads and we'll be doing a great public service. Unfortunately, there's arsenic and other contaminants in there that they aren't going to let you just spray around everywhere so that they get into every, everybody's crops and everybody's well water and everything else. You're still going to have to clean it up. But anyway, here we have a problem. The cryoscopic constant for water is one point 86 degrees per molal. Suppose that a stretch of road in Montana is 70 feet wide and 10 miles long and has a one inch thick layer of ice on it. 
if the ambient temperature is 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and boy, does it get colder than that up there. I remember one winter in Utah, we laughed every day because every day the coldest place in the Intermountain West on the, on the weather was Big Piney, Wyoming. And most of the winter, it was never above zero Fahrenheit. It was minus something. And that's cold. I don't know if you've ever been in minus five degrees Fahrenheit, but if you aren't dressed for it, you're in immediate trouble. If you, get, if you come out in your bathrobe to get the newspaper and the door swings shut, you might have an instant panic if the door locked and you're living in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's that serious, it's that cold. You can die of exposure. But let's assume it's 20 Fahrenheit. The question is, I'm, I'm in charge and I need to know at the start of the day, guy calls me up with the truck, he says, how many 50 pound bags of salt do I need today, boss? I know what the job is, I know how much snow fell, I know I have historical records of what happens with the roads, and I know that if I leave the roads icy, we're going to have a, a lot of accidents and a lot of misery. So I've got to de-ice the roads. So how many 50-pound bags of salt should the trucks use, spreading it evenly, to make sure the road is de-iced, but without using excess salt, because salt is very bad? kills all the plants nearby. I don't want to use more than I need. And then there are all these conversion units. One degree C is 1.8 degrees F. One mile is 50, uh, 5,280 feet. One inch is 2.54 centimeters. One kilogram is 2.2 pounds. And the density of ice is 0.9168 grams per centimeter. This is a great problem. Let's figure out how we're going to do it. Well, we have to depress the freezing point, which is normally, if you're pure water, 32 Fahrenheit, we have to depress the freezing point to 20 Fahrenheit. If we depress the freezing point below 20, that means the ice melts, and that's what we want. It melts and it just runs off the road. And we know what the expression is for freezing point depression. It's delta T, which is always listed as a positive number because we always know the freezing point goes down. So we're, we're saying delta T is some positive number because molality is positive and the cryoscopic constant is positive. But we know that this positive is how far down it went in temperature, because it always depresses. The delta T we need, well, 12 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 32 minus 20, and then convert to Celsius, we need 6.67 degrees Celsius. And therefore, based on our freezing point depression formula, we know how many moles of particles we need the molality of particles we need is the freezing point depression we want divided by the cryoscopic constant, 6.67, divided by 1.86 degrees C goes away, molal to the minus one is underneath, so it's molal. So we need 3.584 molal, moles per kilogram of particles. That means we need half as much salt per kilogram of water. And here I'm going to leave you something to do over the weekend, which is to finish this problem. I'll tell you how to finish it, but I will not tell you the answer. One second. Here's how we finish it. We know the density of ice. We know the volume of ice. We've got one inch, 70 feet, 10 miles. Convert that to kilograms of ice. 
volume times density. So figure out how much the volume of ice on that road is in cubic centimeters by converting all the units and not screwing it up. And then multiply that by 0.9168 to figure out how many grams of ice are on the road. And then divide by 1,000 to get the number of kilograms of ice on the road. Then you know for each kilogram of ice, you need 1.792 moles of sodium chloride. You know the molar mass of sodium chloride. So you know how many grams of sodium chloride you need. You back convert that into pounds because the guy driving the truck, if you tell him what it is in grams, he's lost. And then you divide by 50 and say, look, Joe, load up a thousand bags over and out. And that's what they do. And if you get it wrong, if you don't get the factor of two, you put on twice as much salt as you need. That costs you a ton of money and wrecks the environment. And if you get it wrong and don't put on enough, they drive and waste all that diesel fuel, spraying the solution out, the salting the road, and then it's still hazardous. So it's important to get it right. Okay? Question? Yes. Can you repeat all that? <laughs> Can I repeat all that? Guess what? It's going to be on film, and I promise you that we'll have all the lectures up pronto. So just play it back. Okay? Play it back and then go through it. Yes? Um, you divided 3.5 its formal L by 2 because of I? Or? Be, be, because of I, yes. Because I get two moles of particles from one mole of sodium chloride. And so I don't need as much sodium chloride as because it, I'm lucky I get twice as much freezing point depression with sodium chloride. Okay? And be prepared to solve something like this on next Tuesday. Okay? Just a fun problem, converting units, fiddling around, and actually getting a practical answer. Yes? Next, uh, on Tuesday for the, for the midterm, will we have the entire class for the midterm? Will we have the entire class to do the midterm? Yeah, pretty much, as soon as we hand things out. Pretty much. You'll have the entire class. And we'll try to hand things out as fast as we can, and you can work like crazy. Yes? So you said it was going to be worth more than 200 points? Yes. It will be. I don't know how much more, but it'll, yeah. Yeah. I can't hear you. The website for the lecture videos. The first ones are, are on our class website. Go down to the bottom, click, and you can find. And this will be whatever lecture it is. I think this is 12. Okay? If you want to play this one back in particular. Okay. Let's press on. Practice problem 49. Aha. What is this one? <coughs> Benzene. <coughs> Benzene. Boy, there's been a long history of, of things like benzene. Benzene used to be used as a solvent in organic chemistry labs like crazy. Everybody used it. Except benzene, well, it's known that benzene is poisonous, but benzene is also a class A carcinogen. And one day a crate of benzene came in and it was marked different than before. Before it was just benzene, analytical grade, ready to roll. This one was brightly colored, like if you don't pay your power bill. And it said all these hazardous warnings, and I thought, gee, it would have been nice to know that back then. And there's a moral to that story. If the science hasn't been done, you're on your own. It could be hazardous or not. 
nobody knows yet. And therefore, the wisest thing is to be cautious. Don't expose yourself to all kinds of new things just because they're new. If, there, if there's no evidence about what they may or may not do, you have to be kind of, kind of cautious. I'm still here, though, so probably wasn't that bad. I also washed my hands with chloroform one time, another class A carcinogen, because I had something nasty on my hands, which was even worse. And it was bugging me because it was staining my skin bright yellow, and I thought, that's probably not good. I know, I'll get it off with chloroform. You could never do that these days either. That was a very long time ago. Okay. Uh, benzene here, in skeletal formation, has a carbon and a hydrogen at each position. So it's C6H6. And I've drawn it here as alternating single and double bonds, but it in fact is a perfect hexagon, so it can't possibly be single and double alternating or it would be distorted. And so it, the bonds swap around, as you may know, that's called resonance. And here we have a list of all the mean bond enthalpies for a CH bond, 412, for a CC single bond, 348 kilojoules per mole, CC double bond, 614, CO double bond, almost 800, OO double bond in oxygen, 495, and an OH single bond, 463. And with this table here, I can work out the enthalpy of combustion of benzene. I can estimate it. Well, first, we have to balance the complete combustion reaction. I have six carbons. Therefore, the first, I, first I always write CO2 and H2O for a complete combustion. I have six carbons, and that means I've got to have a six there. I have six hydrogens. H, this is the only thing with hydrogen, so I need three of these guys. And then all I do is carefully count up the oxygens, which won't matter for the combustion reaction, enthalpy, because oxygen has, well, actually, I take that all back. This matters a lot because we need to know how many oxygen bonds we're breaking because we aren't doing it by formation. I've got 12 oxygens here plus 3, that's 15. This is molecular oxygen, so I need 15 halves. The next thing we have to do is we have to count. And boy, you've got to be careful if you're under pressure. Because if you miscount, you get it wrong. You can know exactly how to do it, but if you miscount or you flub it with the calculator, you just get it wrong anyway. Still wrong. We count all the bonds in the reactants and products. For benzene, we've got three carbon-carbon single bonds. Those are the single lines. Three carbon-carbon double bonds. Those are the double lines. And then we've got six hydrogens on e around the ring. So that's six carbon-hydrogen single bonds. For oxygen, we've got seven and a half, because we're just using the numbers, seven and a half OO double bonds. For carbon dioxide, we've got six of them, but each has two CO double bonds. Again, we've got to count the bonds. So that's 12 CO double bonds. And for water, We've got two OH single bonds, but we've got three of them, so we've got six OH bonds. And uh, just as a, an aside, chemists often write notation of the form AXN, like SO4 
or PO4 or ClO4, NO3. There's lots of things like that. Whenever it's written like that, AXN, it means that all the X's are independently stuck onto the A, like the spokes of a bicycle into the hub. And that's how you can count the bonds, if you're just given the formula. If it's not written like that, it still may be like that. H2O, for historical reasons, we don't write OH2. That would be consistent, but we're so used to calling it H2O that we keep it in that order. But that's got an H, an H, and then the oxygen. And if you don't know how they're bonded, you can't count the number of bonds. If you just have a formula and you don't know who's bonded to whom, you can't count the number of bonds, and so you can't get it done. Okay, so you have to know the structure to be able to count. All right, let's, let's then take these and let's count them up. I don't think it's too bad. Let's break all the reactant bonds. We got three carbon single bonds, three carbon double bonds, six carbon hydrogen single bonds, and seven and a half OO double bonds, and that turns out to add up to quite a lot, 9,070.5 kilojoules per mole. And then let's take all the energy to break the product bonds. We've got 12 carbon-oxygen double bonds, that's 12 times 799, plus six uh, ox hydrogen-oxygen single bonds, six times 463, that's even bigger, 12,366. We're making the products, though. We aren't breaking the products into atoms. What we're doing conceptually is we're breaking the reactants into atoms and then we're reassembling the atoms in another way, like Tinker Toys, into the products. And therefore, we don't want this plus energy to make the products. We get this energy back when we make them. And therefore, the delta H of combustion is 9,070.5 minus the 12 366, and that's minus 3,295.5 kilojoules per mole. That's our estimate. I looked in, in the uh, CRC, and the literature value is minus 3,273 kilojoules per mole. It's off by 22 or so. Oh, benzene by this figure, appears to be more stable than what we figured. That might be, these numbers are kind of big, it might be because of our approximate nature of the calculation using these averages over a library of, of compounds. But in fact, benzene is more stable than we would have predicted. Okay? And that, that has consequences because benzene's more stable, and also benzene's stuck together to make bigger things like pyrenes and molecules like that are also more stable. And that means, for example, in cigarette smoke, where you don't have complete combustion, you have particles that have a lot of things like Ben's pyrene and things like that on them. And if you take a mouse and you take Ben's pyrene and you paint it on their skin, they get cancer right where you painted it. Not good stuff. If you're ever working with that, you have to be extremely careful because if you get it on your skin, that can be it. Now you're exposed. Okay, practice problem 50. Let's go way back. Was it just so beautiful or so horrible? Interesting how you can think back. Seems so long ago, doesn't it? 
how far we've come. Barium titanate is a piezoelectric material. A piezoelectric material is a material that if you put an electrical force on, if you put an electric potential on it, it will mechanically deform. Or if you mechanically deform it, it will start generating an electric potential. You may have heard the phrase piezoelectric electric tweeters because they use some of these materials in loudspeakers because they put a voltage on and it mechanically deforms at the same frequency as the voltage. That shakes the air and then you hear the cymbal crash. And the fidelity can be quite good. Now here's a material, barium titanate. And here it is in this big unit cell here. And the question is, if, the, if this is the unit cell for barium titanate, what is the molecular formula for barium titanate? It sort of depends on how good your brain is at figuring out where spheres are. Usually, we would try to put some planes through some sort of dark circle through the thing. But I'll just tell you that these oxygens are on the middle of the faces. They're on the edge. They aren't inside. These guys here are on the exact corner. <coughs> and this guy here is totally inside the box. We're going to use that to get the formula. Remember, Although we draw it like this, the real unit cell is all shaved off because it has to be a perfect cube, so when we put them together, we make an entire crystal. We can't have extra stuff hanging out over the edges. Right? So we can only count what's inside the box, not what's outside. Although we tend not to draw it that way because that turns out to be even more confusing than drawing it this way people have a hard time seeing. Okay, let's look. The barium atoms are on the corners. They're intersected by three planes. Therefore, they only count one-eighth. Or if you imagine, it's only the inner part on the corner, the outer parts are all gone. That's one-eighth. There's eight of them, so there's one barium atom. The Titanium atoms completely inside, and so there's one titanium per unit cell. And the six oxygen atoms are on the six faces. They have one plane through them, so they count half. There's six of them. Six times a half is three. And the charges also help us, although the charges are not always listed with the, with the unit cell. Or sometimes they don't, aren't there. But in this case, they are. It was listed plus two for barium. Well, it's, that's an alkaline earth metal. Plus four for titanium. That's a common oxidation state for titanium. And then three times two minus for oxygen. This is six positive and six negative. The salt's neutral, just like sodium chloride is neutral. <laughs> sodium plus chloride minus. And so the formula is BATIO3, and that's why it's called barium titanate. It's purportedly being used as part of the new capacitor storage systems being investigated for next generation vehicles. So, next generation vehicles, they may have a big, for electric vehicle, they may have a big capacitor in the vehicle too, in addition to the battery. And when you really need to go, the capacitor discharges and supplies you a lot of power very quickly. And then while you're coasting downhill, the car is smart enough to charge the capacitor back up like it does the battery. Yeah? What would happen on a test if you accidentally broke uh, titanium, like titanium, uh, barium, oxygen, and dirty? I'd, I'd give it to you because you aren't a chemist yet. But the reason why it's called barium titanate and sodium chloride, when you see the one that has the IUM, that's first. IUM? Yeah. Sodium. Barium. Okay? Otherwise, it'd be called titanium barium or something like that. 
if it were backwards. But for now, we won't split hairs. Okay? okay? If you get the right number of atoms, we'll take it. Okay? All right. Let's see. Aha! A temperature sensitive, oops, I meant compound. I've got a temper, I'll, I'll fix that. A temperature sensitive compound that is wet, I can't heat it to dry it because if I heat it, it decomposes, it cooks. Now I made this stuff in the lab and the last thing I want to do on the last step to dry it out to weigh it is to cook it. And so I want to get rid of the water, but not by heating it up to 100 so that, so that the water vapor pressure is, is one atmosphere. But I just want to heat it up to 40. And if I know the enthalpy of vaporization of water, then I should know if I have a pump in a speed vac, what pressure I need to hold on the pump in order to be able to drive the water off only at 40 Celsius. I don't want the pressure to be higher than the vapor pressure of water at 40 Celsius. If it's higher, the water will go back onto the compound. If my pressure is lower because I'm pumping fast enough, then the water will just wander off and I'll dry it out and I won't wreck the compound. And this is done all the time in the lab. And we need a, an equation then that relates delta H of vaporization to temperature and I see, ooh, these are in Celsius. Be careful. Well, we have such an equation, the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. And it says if I know the vapor pressure at one temperature, then I can predict the vapor pressure at another temperature, as long as I know delta H, but I know delta H and I know R. Should be fairly easy. The only thing I have to be careful of is this 40, 40 Celsius. If I'm in a hurry, I might put one over 100, one over 40, and I'll get into trouble right away. So let's insert all the numbers. I'm calling conditions one, conditions one is water at 100 Celsius and one atmosphere pressure. So I put P1, one atmosphere, P2 I want to figure out. This is delta H in joules. This is R in joules. Permol goes away. Kelvin to the minus one, that kills this. Good. The log of something is dimensionless. I convert the 100 to 373.15, and I convert the 40 to 313.15, and then I solve all this stuff and I get a number, plus 2.5104. And then I take the exponential function of both sides, which just gets rid of the log, so I have one atmosphere divided by P2 is equal to the exponential function, or e to the 2.5. I punch e to the 2.5 on my calculator. I get 12.31. Therefore, P2 is 1 over 12.31. P2 is 0 0.0812 atmospheres, or 61.7 torr. Oftentimes the meter will actually be listed in tor just because people find it easier to read 60 tor than 0.08 something in atmosphere. It may be too big a unit. Yes? Was pressure one of the same thing? Uh, I know the vapor pressure of water is one atmosphere at its boiling point. Okay, that, that I do know. And we can, we can achieve this with any decent pump. Now, we, we had to make some assumptions that the material itself has very low vapor pressure. If the material has high vapor pressure, we'll actually pump it off, too. 
and you have to be careful sometimes depending what you've got. Otherwise, you end up pumping your product into the pump oil of the pump, and then people get very angry with you when you pump things into the pump oil because that wrecks the pump oil for the next person. Okay, last one. 52. A careless scientist has measured the vapor pressure of toluene That's the stuff in airplane glue that kids got into for a while. None of them were chemists, I assure you. <laughs> chemists do not sniff anything, ever. I measured the vapor pressure of toluene in atmospheres here. <coughs> The boiling point of toluene is about 110. This looks, to me, this data looks okay. And then, after the measurement, now the goal of the project was to, de de was to excuse me, determine delta H of vaporization for toluene. Well, I've got all this data. This is much, much better than two points because I, if I can plot this data as a straight line, I can then do linear regression and I can get a great line through all of it, and then I can get the slope of that line and that's minus delta H over R. So I can get it, just have to do a little analysis. Well, here's what happened. He plots log P versus 1 over T and comes to you and says, help, boss, help. It's not straight. What's going wrong? He, he took the log okay, I guess. First of all, what's wrong with this graph? the axes are not labeled with the units. Whenever you see a graph where the axes are not labeled, stand back. Don't start looking at the graph. Try to figure out what the units were. Now he had things like 20 degrees, and I notice he's got 05, and I notice that 1 over 20 is 0.05. And so I figure this guy's a dope. What he's done is he's plotted the log of the pressure okay, but he's plotted it versus 1 over T in Celsius. And that's why it's curved, because it has to be 1 over T in Kelvin. And he's careless because he didn't put the units here, which should be K to the minus 1, or in his case, degree C to the minus 1. If you would have seen degree C to the minus 1, you would have said, hey, that's wrong. We never plot anything in chemistry like that. We always use Kelvin. And therefore, if you go back and do it, and so here's the conclusion. The data is okay. The graph doesn't have units. We can see that the log of the pressure is okay, because you can take the log of, of that. And the reference pressure is one atmosphere. Um, but it, it's in Celsius, okay? And what I'd like you to do is go back, convert it to Kelvin, plot it, and see if it's straight. And then here are the last important points for Tuesday. First, same seating chart. Second, We have to do some spot roll taking, therefore make sure you have your ID, because somebody will come around, say you're in G7, or you Joe Blow. Third, practice. And finally, don't count on looking things up in your notes. 
That's a slow algorithm. And I hope you do well.